Okay, well, I think we'll start. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, first of all, a bit of practical bits. Secondly, duty to cooperate, alternatives, flexibility, and then reform. I think the ha having done a couple of local plan examinations now, the key message is just keep calm and carry on. Speak to local authorities who've done it. If any of you know of people at South Oxfordshire, for example, um, that uh, examination went uh, really well, I think. So um, contact those who've done it uh, and speak to them. But uh, one of the key factors in having a successful examination is the electronic document library. And there's new PINs guidance about that issued about two weeks ago. Master, obviously, the video technology. Uh, have a fail safe. What are we going to do so that everybody knows if the connection goes down? Um, and then make sure that you have a system in place for communicating within the council's home team during the examination, uh, either if you're uh, all assembled in one room or if you're all working remotely. And I've done it both ways uh, and both work. Make sure you keep a running list of homework set by the inspector and have systems in place to um, address that. And then do have reserve days. Um, particularly if there are technological difficulties um, and extra time is needed. The duty to cooperate is um, still a thorny issue. And a key point to remember is that um, it's both a legal and a policy soundness issue. And what the legal duty requires is constructive engagement, active engagement on an ongoing basis during the preparation of the plan. So not just during um, the latter stages, but throughout the whole of the preparation of the plan. And the cases show that it's so much more than a consultation exercise once the formal stages in plan making are, are reached. It's not a duty to agree or, or even to meet unmet needs. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, these things are relevant. And only on the, as recently as three days ago, so that was on Friday, uh, there was the uh, judgment given in the challenge by Seven Oaks Council's uh, officers to their inspector's conclusion that they had failed the legal duty to cooperate. Now, they were, Seven Oaks was part of a wider housing market area. It was uh, constrained by Greenbelt and AONB. They had a joint housing market uh, area evidence base. There'd been plenty of discussions with stakeholders, there were officer and member forum meetings, there were statements of common ground, there was a peer review. They cooperated and uh, taken part in a planning advisory service project. So everything you might have thought was going in their favor. But they had unmet need and no other planning authority was said to be in a position to assist with it. But Seven Oaks did not formally request help until very late in the process from their neighbours. And their neighbours said, no, we can't help. Um, there were warning flags raised during the inspector's advisory visit and even um, the CLG were involved. And there was a duty to cooperate workshop um, of all the Kent local authorities chaired by a former inspector. And that former inspector concluded that Seven Oaks had done all it can, but still the inspector found problems. Uh, the real problem was, was that the, the minutes of meetings that they relied on in discharging the duty to cooperate through 2017 and 2018 made no mention of unmet need and how it could be met. And the first mention that Seven Oaks might have a problem meeting its need was raised after the Reg 19 consultation and only seven weeks prior to the submission. And therefore, the inspector said that the statements of common ground, nobody was contending that Seven Oaks had failed, had failed the duty to cooperate. All of the other local authorities were supportive. But the inspector said, these statements of common ground had been prepared too late to influence the preparation of the plan and uh, the inspector found that the reason why Seven Oaks didn't ask its neighbours to assist with meeting unmet need 
after the Reg 18 consultation was that they thought the answer was likely to be no, and therefore they didn't bother to ask. Uh, in effect, they were postponing meeting on net need until the plans review, and the inspector said, even a pragmatic approach couldn't save the failure of the duty to cooperate. And Mr. Justice Dove uh, rejected Seven, Seven Oaks's four grounds of legal challenge. Here are two extracts from the inspector's findings um, with my um, yellow highlighting, just to illustrate the sorts of problems. Uh, and she essentially found two things. One is, if there'd been earlier notice about this unmet need, the neighbours might have been able to help, or, and that's, this is the middle bit of the, the yellow, the council would have had time to formally reconsider its own constraints and reach a final view on whether or not it could appropriately fully meet its housing needs. Um, in, in other words, if you can't meet your needs and your neighbours can't help, then um, it, you ought to be looking back and seeing whether or not your own district or borough is as constrained as you first thought it was. Uh, the inspector said this process may or may not have led to the same outcome, but there was no guarantee. Uh, those sorts of messages are carried forward from earlier case studies at St Albans, where the inspector criticised the lack of a structured approach engagement too broad brush, outcomes not being clearly recorded, planning authority not being proactive, St Albans failing to respond or failing to contribute, and that they had not left every stone unturned or made every effort. That shouldn't be surprising because the same sorts of things went on in Castle Point as long ago as 2016, where for example, memoranda of understanding were left late in the process and Castle Point were criticised for falling short of making every effort. So uh, there are key messages there that the duty to cooperate is still a live issue uh, and needs to be taken seriously. Alternatives, alternative strategies, alternative sites, I think the key message from uh, recent examinations is this. Authorities who start with the outcome or a preconceived idea of what the outcome is they want to reach in terms of a strategy, in terms of the sites that they're going to select. Uh, and then what I've called fiddle the evidence, i.e. You start with where you want to be and, and then you make sure that the evidence fits that conclusion rather than starting with the evidence and then letting the evidence lead you towards a conclusion as to which of the alternative options on offer should be selected. Uh, and what uh, inspectors will be looking for is simple and inescapable logic. Flexibility how much is enough? This is the issue as to, well, if we need to uh, meet a need of 250 houses a year, how many houses do we need to plan for in order to ensure that 250 are delivered? Because if you only aim to deliver 251 a year, then it doesn't take very much to blow your plan off course and various authorities have tackled this in a number of different ways. In Runnymede, um, they were allowing for a lapse rate of 15%, even with a 6% flexibility allowance. And then in Guildford, they went for 37% above objectively ass assessed need because they wanted to future-proof the plan. And in the High Court, and they released sites in the Greenbelt to allow that to happen, and in the High Court, the judge rejected a submission from the uh, Parish Council that only 20% should have been adopted so that um, not all of the Green Belt uh, releases would have been needed. But that submission was rejected by the court on the basis that it was a matter of planning judgment. 
So there is no hard and fast answer, but quite significant amount of flexibility have been built into plans and have been found to be lawful. Now, I want to um, spend a little time considering what we all should do now that there is at least the prospect of a revised system, plan making system uh, on the table in the form of the proposals in the white paper. You will have seen in the planning press recently that so certain local authorities have um, already come out and said that they're going to pause. Bromsgrove in Worcestershire for one. Um, but Winchester has said it's going to pause, but it, it says it's doing that because it's going to take part in a, a PINS zoning pilot. Uh, the South Worcestershire development plan is on pause. Uh, both because of the impact of COVID on plan making function in the three authorities, um, as well as for uncertainty, uh, and that's said to going to result in a 12 month delay. And then Warrington has said that it's going to pause until the outcome of the standard method reform is clearer and also because of COVID effects. Uh, I think there's a real risk uh, and danger for local authorities if you simply down tools and stop the plan making function. It will be much easier to continue with the current system and then to adapt that, uh, whatever the new, the new system is. And there will be transitional arrangements in the new system. And I suspect that we will get quite a lot of notice uh, from the department as to when the new system is going to come into effect, what it will be and what the transitional uh, arrangements are. Now, it was very interesting that Bromsgrave decided that it was going to pause and it caused me to look back at plan, plan making uh, in Bromsgrove. And I, I discovered that in the, the last two occasions that Bromsgrove have made a plan or brought forward a plan. The first round of, of plan making that I look back on was the uh, as far back as November 1991, when they produced a draft local plan. And it went through the old system of deposit, pre-inquiry changes, an inquiry, modifications, a modification inquiry. They declined to accept all of the inspectors uh, recommendations, so there had to be an alterations process. And then 13 years later, in January 2004, they adopted that local plan. And by then, all of the allocations in the plan had been built out. Uh, you'll recall that 2004 was when the 2004 Act came into effect with the new system of plan making, and Bromsgrove announced that they were going to do much better this time. And so in January 2005, they produced their core strategy issues and options paper. Uh, they produced then two rounds of preferred options. And then they decided that they were going to switch from core strategies and area action plans and site allocations plan. They were going to switch to having it all in one local plan. So there was a pause while that catch up was uh, reached. They submitted the plan in 2014. Um, the inspector paused the process in 2015, sending them away to do some uh, further homework for a year. The examination resumed in 2016 and eventually they adopted their local plan in January 2017. Twelve years that took them. Uh, round three, the one that they've just paused, they started off in September 18 with issues and options. In late 2019, there was a call for sites. Uh, and then in October 2020, as we've heard, it's paused. The next iteration is due to be the preferred options whenever it happens. What this shows is that plan making takes time. And the longer you pause, the more time it is going to take, not just for the 
at the period of the pause, but also because um, evident, the evidence base gets out of date, you need to refresh the evidence base. I think that local authorities need to keep going on plan making, keep searching for the right strategy, keep asking people what they think the right strategy should be, keep looking then for the right sites to meet the strategy, keep asking people what they think the right site should be. And if it turns out that the new system is a simpler, more cheerful zoning system, then all of that work can be adapted into the new system rather than waiting for the uh, new system to become abundantly clear before progressing the work. That's what I want to say on plan making. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. See you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.